Welcome to this video looking at inductors and inductive reactants and some applications of inductors. This is all part of the electromagnetism unit for the advanced higher physics course. So the things that we're going to speak about in this video is looking at the relationships for inductance. We have the two that are required for advanced higher physics, one related to voltage and current, the other one related to frequency and look at a few applications of inductors. Like a capacitor, an inductor is a component that can have different properties depending on the frequency of the AC supply. So when we put it in an AC circuit, the inductor has what we call inductive reactance, and that is the opposition to the flow of the alternating current. And that's measured in resistance, it's similar to resistance in the sense that resistance is the opposition to the flow of current, but it's different because it depends upon the frequency. And it also depends upon the inductance of the inductor. But reactance or inductive reactance is measured in ohms. Inductors are often used in alternating current circuits to block particular signals whilst allowing DC signals to transmit through them because a DC signal isn't dependent on the frequency. And as we said previously, the opposition to the flow of this current in the inductor is called the inductive reactance. And the inductive reactance, XL, is equal to the ratio of the potential difference across the inductor and the current through the inductor. Okay, so let's look at an example. We've got an inductor in an AC circuit with 120 volts, 60 hertz AC supply. And when asked to work out the inductive reactants, the current in the circuit for those conditions, and then also state and explain what happens when we increase the frequency from 60 hertz to 400 hertz and what happens to the reactants of the inductor and what happens to the current in the circuit as a result of that. So let's look at the first part of the question. Calculate the inductive reactants. So we have the uh, frequency here. So we're going to use the relationship that the inductive reactance is 2 pi F L and substitute in our values and we get a value of 113 ohms. We're then asked to work out the effective current for those particular conditions. And we can use the fact that the inductive reactance is the ratio of the voltage to the current, having just worked out what the reactance is. And then we can rearrange to get the current for those conditions of 1.06 amperes. Okay, so the frequency of the supply is increased 400 hertz. We're asked to state and explain what happens to the reactance of the inductor and the current in the circuit. So if the frequency increases, then the inductive reactance will increase because XL is 2 pi F times L. And if the reactance of the inductor is increasing, then the current will decrease because XL is equal to V over I. Sometimes you can be asked about an experiment to show the relationship between the frequency and the inductive reactance, or the frequency and the current through an inductor. And this is what this question here is about. So we have our particular circuit with a signal generator, which is an AC supply of one that we can change the frequency of. And we have an ammeter and our inductor with our own core and a voltmeter collected across the signal generator. And we would change the frequency, measure the current, and then adjust the frequency for a range of values, repeating as necessary to make the experiment more reliable. And here we've got three questions. What's the purpose of the voltmeter? Describe the data obtained and how we should analyze it to determine the relationship and state the expected relationship. 
So let's deal in each of these in turn. So the purpose of the voltmeter, well, the purpose of the voltmeter here is as we change the frequency, we're going to expect the readings on the ammeter to change. So as we've got higher frequency, we're expecting there to be more reactants, so more opposition to the flow of current, so the, the reading on the ammeter to decrease. Um, the voltmeter is there to make sure that the output from the signal generator remains the same, because if we have a greater output, then that would be one reason for the current to change because the voltage has increased or decreased. So we want to make sure that it remains constant. So describe how the data obtained should be analyzed to determine the relationship between current in the inductive circuit and the frequency. So what we need to do there is we need to look at the relationships for inductive reactants, XL, and we can see that's two pi FL or V over I. So if we rearrange that for I, we get I equals V over two pi L times one over F. So that means that's in the form of a relationship Y equals M times X, where Y is our current and X is one over frequency. So if we plot a graph of current against one over frequency, that should give us a straight line of which the gradient will be the voltage divided by two pi times L. So we could even determine the inductance from this type of uh, graph. Okay, or the alternative would be to multiply I times F and then that would be equal to the voltage divided by two pi L. And so that would be a constant for this particular inductor and this particular experiment to conditions. And so if all of those values are constant that we've measured, then that would be a way of proving our relationship. So we've either got a straight line graph that's directly proportional, or we have constant values for the set of readings that we've taken. Okay, a little reminder about capacitive reactants. So capacitive reactants is the opposition to the flow of current through a capacitor. And similarly, it's measured in ohms. It's also the ratio of the voltage to the current, but this time it's a slightly different relationship uh, for the frequency because the higher the frequency, the less the reactants and the more the current. I'm reminding you about this because many circuits have capacitors and inductors within them. And so the properties, albeit similar, they both are dependent upon frequency. They act in opposing ways so we can use them for different purposes. OK, so moving on to some of those uses of capacitors, and inductors is because they're reactive components, we can use them as filters in systems. Um, in audio systems, they can be used to filter out different frequencies. So capacitors have low reactants at high frequencies. Inductors have low reactants at low frequencies. So we've got our two speakers there in our speaker, two loudspeakers. So one's our woofer, one's the tweeter, the treble parts. And what we can do is we can have the capacitor in series with the tweeter because that will allow the high frequency signals to be transmitted through it. And we can have the inductor in series with the woofer, the base uh, signals. Okay, so inductors are used as low pass filters. They allow low frequency signals to pass and they remove high frequency signals because when there's high frequency, you get a large reactance. Whereas capacitors do the opposite. They pass high frequency and they remove low frequency. So we've got the graphs of the properties versus the frequency here. So reminder that for a resistor, the frequency makes no difference to the resistance, but we can see that the effects on the capacitor and the inductor. Okay, so one further example. We've got a capacitor and inductor used in a hi-fi loudspeaker circuit. 
and here we can see the tweeter with the capacitor in series and the woofer with the inductor in series and we have to explain why they've been picked this way around and then we have to determine the capacitance and the inductance of the inductor and, and the capacitor given the reactance of eight ohms and the particular frequency. Okay, so let's look at the first answer. So why do we use the capacitor in series? Well, we've just stated that capacitors allow high frequency signals to pass and low frequencies to be blocked. Explain why we use an inductor with the woofer. Well, the woofer allows low frequencies to pass and blocks high frequency signals. Calculate the capacitance of the capacitor, given that it has a reactance of 8 ohms. So there's our relationship for capacitive reactance. Um, we substitute in our values and we get 6.6 .6 microfarads of capacitance. Then we're asked to calculate the inductance of the inductor. And again, we start with our reactance formula and we substitute in our values and we get 42 millihenries of inductance. Okay, so a very similar question here. Loudspeaker, capacitor, inductor. We've got two loudspeakers, loudspeaker one, loudspeaker two. Circuit's designed so that one loudspeaker emits low frequency sounds and the other emits high frequency sounds. By comparing the capacitive and inductive reactants, describe how this system operates. So what we're looking for here is we're looking for loudspeaker one, will produce low frequency sounds because the inductive reactance at low frequency is low and loudspeaker 2 will produce high frequency sounds because the capacitive reactance is low at high frequencies. So moving on to some quick examples of the use of inductors and capacitors within circuits. And we have a circuit here showing the circuit diagram of a defibrillator. So a defibrillator has both a capacitor and an inductor within it. And we can charge up the capacitor to its particular voltage uh, by pressing the switch, but then that capacity is discharged through the inductor. So the inductor opposes the rate of change in current and ensures that the current delivered to the patient is high enough for long enough. So because it's opposing that change, it's opposing the reduction, so it stays large enough from there. And we use the inductor rather than a resistor to make sure all of the energy is passed to the patient as inductors um, generate a lot less heat than resistors do. Another use is um, eddy current braking. So this is the way that some trains break and also the way that Formula One cars break. And we've got a rotating disc uh, in the picture there and we've got a small round magnet just in that particular area. And when the disc moves within there, because we've got movement and a magnet, we get tiny little eddy currents being produced but the field is only acting on a tiny part of the disk and so it flows back in and so we get these eddy currents and these eddy currents in turn create a magnetic field and that magnetic field opposes the motion that we've got. So what happens is that the it stops because of the magnetic opposition of these, these two parts. So we can use that to brake trains, Formula One cars, um, also used to stop saw blades from turning as well. Uh, some of you may have an electric cooker hob that works by induction heating. 
The advantage of these is that the cooker hob surface itself doesn't get hot. And what happens is that you put your saucepan on the top and there's a coil of copper wire with an alternating current through. This results in a changing magnetic field and this changing magnetic field induces currents within the saucepan which cause it to heat up. So it's actually very efficient and only the saucepan itself gets hot so it's a lot safer to use. Um, it also doesn't get hot at all if there's no saucepan on it. Um, eddy currents are also used for metal detectors and uh, indeed the uh, detectors that we might see in shops that are uh, either side of the doors. So we've got a transmitter coil and a receiving coil of wire and when a person carries a metal object between the two coils there is a current induced in that metal object that they've got and that metal object then induces its current which then because it's moving it creates a magnetic field and that magnetic field induces a current in the receiving coil and because it's opposing the current the current changes slightly and this triggers the alarm and um, the person knows that you've got something metal on you or you've tried to take something out of the shop if you peel off some of the things that you might buy you'll notice that the in shops you'll notice that they've got tiny bits of metal circuits in there and that's to induce these eddy currents that induce a magnetic field that then induce a current that opposes the current in the secondary coil and we can notice this changing effect from that um, similar system works for hearing aid um, systems and um, the barriers that lift up at car parks when you approach them um, to let you to let you out or let you in particularly because normally you've got to pay to let you out but those barriers that lift up and down there they work in a similar way they um, have a coil in the road they induce a current within the uh, metal of the car the engine block usually and then that in turn produces a magnetic field which then is picked up in this in the other coil in the road and causes it to uh, lift up the barrier so what we've looked at here is we've looked at a number of problems in uh, alternating current circuits to work out the inductive reactance and the frequency and we've also looked at some applications of inductors and some applications of inductors and capacitors.